Well, why don't we look through any more questions at the end? This seems like it's working. I can certainly hear myself in yeah. a natural way. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you're going to have to all experience something horrible. My handwriting. <laughs> this is actually me trying to write legend. Uh, you don't want to see the normal handwriting. I don't know what happened to me. I look at my notes when I was in grad school. It's all very clear. Now I think there's just some psychological stress that just. You can, actually, this isn't. I think I have now a, actually a learning disability. I think I could get. Some of my students, they, 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 their handwriting is so bad they get to use computers. It's technically learning uh, disability. Um, so suffer briefly, and then hopefully I'll be able to decipher everything for you. Uh, I thought I would just talk about kind of a history of the concept of caliphate and how it interacts with other notions of authority, or at least political authority, and uh, concepts of political legitimacy in, the, in Islamic civilization. Uh, one of the first things to keep in mind in uh, Islamic civilization is, as the great historian Marshall Hodgson called it, it's really better to call it Islamicate civilization. Islamicate civilization. Uh, why? Because Islamic civilization suggests that everything is rooted in Islam, has some basis in Islam, is an expression of Islam. Whereas what actually happened historically is that the Muslim conquest of the Middle East led to the creation of a, an amalgamation of the pre-existing cultural, political, religious traditions of the Near East and Islam, and then express itself in an Islamic idiom. But lots of the institutions of Islamic hate civilization, which ultimately spread um, from Morocco to Southeast Asia, many of those institutions, they're not mentioned in the Quran, they're not mentioned in the Sunnah of the, the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, they are institutions that are developed either from pre-existing uh, institutions that preceded Islam, or that Muslims came up with, things like pious endowments, things like the madrasa, things like uh, mosques, uh, or uh, things like the idea of the sultanate. Uh, these are all notions, the fact that you have someone in Brunei who calls, calls himself the sultan of Brunei in Indonesia, or sorry, Malaysia is a federation of, of multiple states, each with its own sultan. Uh, the Quran never says Verily, there is this notion of the sultanate, and this is what the office means. So it's something that was uh, in, inducted, maybe, by Muslim scholars from their scripture, and then uh, used to describe existing notions of rule. And so it's, it's actually these, these institutions, like uh, the Medrasa, the Sufi Brotherhood, um, the idea of sultanate, the Sharia, these institutions are what bind together Islamic Kate civilization. But not all of them are actually rooted in the original scriptures of Islam. So this is a very important distinction that, that Marshall Hodgson made and is very helpful. Uh, Amin's had to suffer through us and endlessly discussing this in our Islamic Civ class, where he was my TA for several years. Okay, so when you, when you begin with the, I thought we'd just talk about sort of three concepts or idioms for talking about rule or authority that appear in the lifetime of the prophet and in the immediate, let's say, 20 years after his death in 632 of the Common Era. One of them the, over here is imama. Imama means leadership generally. Now, if you look in, not only in the hadiths of the prophet, his sayings of the prophet Muhammad, which are uh, problematic as a source because a lot of them are made up after the death of the prophet by various competing factions in political, sectarian, legal disputes. Uh, so they oftentimes reflect existing disputes instead of really exactly what the prophet said. But if we assume that there's some origin of this material in the early Islamic period, you can see it expressed there. And you also see it expressed in fiqh or Islamic jurisprudence when they talk about concepts of leadership. Uh, so we talk, let's say, about the first 300 years of Islam, you have, the notion of leadership is actually extremely important, just imama, for the theorization of authority, for the theorization of rule. Now, it becomes, there's ambiguity here because the person who leads the prayer is the imam. So we could all pray right now and I could be the imam. And 
and I have no authority over you. I just have to be the person who leads the prayer. But the leader of the community is also called the imam. So Muslim legal scholars discuss the qualifications for imama as leadership of prayer, and they talk about the qualifications for imam as the leadership of the community. And there's the two overlap, because one of the things that the imam, the leader of a community, whether it's the leader of the Muslims overall, or the leader of a, of a city, or the governor of a province, one of the things he's supposed to do is lead the community in prayer. But uh, that, that ambiguity is important because you see that there is this overlap of religious leadership and temporal leadership. Now, the person who leads the prayer doesn't necessarily have any, like I said, I don't, my, the fact that I happen to think you know, certain thing is right or wrong in Islamic law, I have no right to force that upon the people whom I lead in prayer. But there is this notion of religious leadership in the sense of, act, of leading the, the community in prayer. The second concept is that of khilafa. That's the idea of successorship. And as you saw, this is the term that's invoked by Abu Bakr. He's the, the khalifa, the, success, the successor of the prophet of God. <coughs> and the last one in, boy, this is it's an R, I guess, imara. Imara means command. So the, the word in amir is the active participle or the, 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 a noun from the, ver, the, 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 the verbal noun of imara, of command. He's the commander. And oftentimes when the prophet talks about commanders, he's talking about, I'm making someone a commander for a campaign. This person is your commander. You obey this person on this campaign. So it can be a commander in the limited sense of a military campaign, and it can be the commander in the greater sense of being the leader of the community. And that's, again, the term that Omar takes is we need the commander of the faithful. And this is the most common term you'll see for the first, uh, I'd say, 200, at least 200 years of Islamic history. And any of my students, since I have so much respect for you, having either had no impact on you or had a lot of impact on you, <laughs> any of you who think I've made a mistake and you want to correct me, please raise your hands. These two, because these two are very interested in political history. If you guys have any corrections, feel free to. I would, I would guess around the first 200 years, really, Amir al is what the leaders call themselves, commander of the faithful. Now, uh, so basically, time goes on. You have the first four caliphs who are often later termed the, the, the rightly guided caliphs, and Khulafa al Rashidun. Uh, oh, Abu Bakr rules for only two years. Omar rules for uh, 10 years, assassinated. Uh, Uthman rules for 12 years, assassinated. And Ali rules for three years, four years, is assassinated. Five, yeah, five. Almost five. 656 is 660. For, let's say, four years. Uh, when you say assassinated, you don't mean killed in battle. Do you? No, I mean assassinated, you know, like, I'm going to pray, like, stabbed in the back, assassinated. That's how Ali was, um, a man was killed in his house by right, right, a right. large group of disgruntled Muslims. Okay, that's and assassin. Omar was stabbed as well by an assassin. But Ali was killed in, during a war. No, no, no. He was killed when he was walking to... It was during a war, and right. there was a civil war going on, right. but he was walking to the mosque to pray in Kufa, and he was stabbed by one, a Kharijite assassin. That's right. Ibn Mojan was his name. Okay. Then, uh, in the first civil war, basically starts about 656 to 660, and we won't go into what the different parties are, but the group that triumphs is the Umayyad dynasty, the Umayyad family, which then becomes the first dynasty. And uh, this is, when you were referring to about the prophet not liking kings, is in one hadith he talks about uh, you'll have a certain number of rightly guided caliphs, and then you'll have uh, which is uh, kings who bite, like kings who won't let go. They bite on and just cling on. So there's this idea that kings don't really have legitimacy. There, and, and then you, you in, see this with the in Umayyad. Allah's eyes. In Allah's eyes. Well, no, the king doesn't have legitimacy because a king, what is, I mean, it's very clear in, in the, the time of the Prophet and Abu Bakr and Omar and Uthman and Ali that you don't get, you don't become the ruler because your father was a ruler. You dynastic. become the ruler through some kind of dynastic. Procedure. No dynastic. Yeah, there's not a dynastic notion. Whereas the Umayyads introduced the notion of, di of dynastic succession. Actually, right. Ali did too. 
Uh, no, I mean if you're if you're if you're Shiite and you, then you believe that there is dynastic succession, but it's not dynastic succession just because you're the son. You're done. You 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 have succession from the previous imam because your father happens to transfer to you. It's called nas or this uh, esoteric perfect understanding of the religion. So your other sons are basically, you know, they can go be cobblers or whatever they want to do. But they have no they have no right to succession. The only person with right to succession is the one who receives the and transmission right. of this authority. The anointment. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it's not. When we talk about succession, you're dynastic succession, you're talking about it's basically your belonging to a certain family that gives you the right to rule. Uh, and that is introduced by the, the Umayyads. Mm -hmm. And of course, the Umayyad dynasty uh, makes their capital in Damascus from 660 until the late six, uh, 740s when they're challenged by the last group that actually successfully overthrows them in 750, the Abbasid dynasty. This is a dynasty that starts out in north, uh, north uh, eastern Persia, but is led by a descendant from the prophet's uncle Abbas. And so they take, they take the name of uh, the Abbasid dynasty. They build the city of Baghdad in the uh, 760s, and they, that's the imperial capital until uh, 1258. Well, there's, they occasionally go to other places when they feel like it, but that's basically the capital until 1258 when it's sacked by the Mongols. Now, um, around, and there's no exact date here, sometimes people like to talk about the year 945, but I think that's on the later end. From the mid 800s to the mid 900s, an important change occurs in the, this Muslim empire. It is one state. Uh, in 636, 637, the Muslims conquer Syria and Iran. In 650, they re in Central Italy, they've reached the city of Marv, which is now on the border between uh, Uzbekistan and, and Tajikistan, or sorry, Tajikistan and uh, uh, Iran. In 711, they invade Iberia, the Iberian Peninsula, and also Sindh in India. So you see this huge territorial conquest that, that uh, occurs. And one of the features of pre-modern states is that if you have a large territorial, a large area of territorial control in theory, it's going to be actually very hard to control that in reality. States simply do not have the technology to do that. They don't have the technology in terms of communication, in terms of transportation, in terms of administration. So what happens is this: as long as you're expanding, you can maintain control because your armies, your, your, they're off fighting other people. The second you stop expanding, you have a problem, because now these armies are saying, well, what are we going to do now? Who's going to pay us? And if I'm not getting any spoils of war, so I'm going to start paying me a salary. And if you, just start, if you don't get, give them a salary from the central government, then they eventually kind of carve out local uh, statelets or, or states that are under the suzerainty of the central state, but in reality are pseudo-independent. So you get basically the emergence of local, local dynasties. This begins really in the early to mid 800s, and by the, the mid 900s, it's become the reality. By the mid 900s, the Abbasid Caliphs are no longer exercising any real temporal authority, except maybe just in Baghdad. Even then, they don't really uh, act. They're, they're at that point a figurehead. And this is a process that, that begins, let's say, the mid 800s and completes in the, the mid 900s. At that point, you have a new, by that time, a new mode of rule, conception of, of state has developed. You have the caliph, and this is really when the notion of the caliph becomes important. Before that, it, you know, it's one of these things. When someone's really in a power, they don't need to stress that they're in power. You know? If someone's really the authority, they don't have to sit around talking about the authority all the time. They might even not even have a title. They're just the person in charge. Uh, it's really when you have a splitting of, let's say, theoretical or nominal symbolic authority and actual temporal authority, then you have to, then titles become much more important. So what happens in the mid 900s is this group called the uh, Buya dynasty. It's a, basically a band of warlord Turkic brothers from well, they're Persians actually from northeastern Iran. Uh, they come, they take over all Iran, they take over Iraq. 
and they go to Baghdad and they become the protector, they offer to become the protector of the caliph. And that's, they rule under this title, they are the protectors of the caliph. But in fact, the caliph is now, in effect, uh, as he had been for some time before that, actually a hostage, and uh, under the, this, the control of whoever is really in charge. And this is where you have really a distinction between the sultan, which is the authority, and basically what that means is a military warlord. And thus you happen to live in you know, the, the, the Republic of Venice, or the Republic of uh, um, uh, Ragusa, later Dubrovnik. <coughs> Most human beings in history live under some kind of military authority because the person who has weapons and the ability to force people to obey uh, and to provide their security uh, will, will be the ruler. So this, uh, the Sultan is really a, a, an effective military warlord of one form or the other. Uh, in, the, in the central Islamic lands from the 900s until the 1200s, they're either a Persian or they're uh, Turkic. In some cases, there's a few dynasties, local dynasties like in Mosul where they're Arabs, but most of the time they're uh, Turkic or Persian. And, uh, and so you have Sultan with an S, that's an S at the end in brackets, because it, there's not just one sultan anymore. So the, the Buyids happen to control Iran and Iraq, but there's all sorts of other dynasties. There is the Ikhshidi dynasty in Egypt, there is dynasty in Tunis, there's dynasty in what's now Morocco, there's a dynasty in what's now Yemen, there's dynasty in the uh, parts of Iran outside of Buyid control. And these are all sultans. And in theory, they all recognize the nominal authority of the Abbasid Caliph. They will print coins, if they mint coins, they mint coins with the title of the, or the picture of the Abbasid Caliph. Uh, if they, in their Friday prayer sermons, you hear prayers for the Abbasid Caliph. So the Abbasid Caliph, the Caliph really uh, continues to provide the overarching theoretical unity of Islamic civilization, of this Islamic state, even though in reality you have lots of different local uh, authorities who were really in charge. So uh, this was should not have, this should have been over here, but I wrote it too early. 1258, important date. Baghdad falls, uh, conquered by the Mongols, and people oftentimes is, yes. Is that a problem with that? No, not a problem. <laughs> no, he disagreed. Just, just an exception to that, the fat, Fatimid the, the dynasty actually had a large and large territory, but did not adhere to the caliph. Oh yeah, well, well, that's a good point, but I'll, I'll, just, I'll, I'll mention that. That's a good point. Um, yes, that's a, it's an important point, which I actually was planning to talk about. But uh, the, the, even the term caliph doesn't become that important. So 945, the Buyids take over. Now, early, earlier in the 900s, a, a, a Shiite religious movement that began in Syria and then was defeated there and moved over into North Africa, what's now Algeria, and then with the help of this Berber tribe, basically takes over North Africa, and eventually in the 960s conquers Egypt, and creates, founds the city of, what's now the city of Cairo, in around 969. That, in the early 900s, that movement, which later becomes called the Fatimid dynasty, takes the title of Caliph. So now, in the 920s, the title Caliph is, starts, become, it's, it becomes really a, more of a currency of authority or a currency of contention because now there's more than one person claiming to be Caliph. In the, when you, the Abbasids were defeated in 750, the survivors of the Umayyad dynasty fled to Spain and actually the Umayyad dynasty continued in Spain until around 1000 of the common year. And when the, uh, they just call themselves the Emirs, the Emir al when the Fatimid Shiites called themselves the Caliph, then the Umayyads in Spain also called themselves the Caliph. So around, I think it was the year 929. Can you check that for me, Amy? 929, is that correct? I think so. Okay, in 929, the, um, the Umayyad ruler in Spain also calls himself the Caliph. So it's sort of like the, the period in the late 1300s and early 1400s in, in Italy and southern France when you have three popes. So now you have three Caliphs. Exactly. So the reason why the term caliphate, one of the reasons it becomes more important is now a lot of people are, are, are claiming it, and so it, its per currency rises. Uh, 1258, Baghdad falls to the Mongols, and most of the Abbasid family is wiped out. 
Now, all of them, because some of them flee to Egypt, and actually, this is important, the Abbasid Caliphate continues in Egypt under the protection of the Mamluk dynasty until 1517. And that's not just, people sometimes think that's, they, sometimes they call it the Shadow Caliphate. It, it's actually very important. And it's important not necessarily just for the Mamluk dynasty in Egypt and Syria, but Muslim states that are arising elsewhere in the Muslim world, at this time in the 1200s and 1300s, is when you really have expansion of Muslim rule in India, in Central Asia, uh, eventually in Southeast Asia in the 1400s and 1500s. The, the uh, Delhi Sultans, who were really the first major dynasty in India, from 1192 until the late 1300s when they are destroyed by Tamerlan, they, in the early 1300s, they get a letter of investiture from the Abbasid Caliph saying, I recognize you as my legitimate representatives in India. And that, that's so important that this letter is always read at the Friday prayer. And they, the Delhi Sultans actually build a whole city. Now if you go to the, if you ever go to Delhi, there's an area called uh, uh, Kauskos, which now has really upscale, nice furniture shopping and good restaurants. But it's a, that actual area was called, uh, it was built for the a representative of the Abbasid dynasty. They built a whole little city just for a representative of the Abbasid dynasty to come. So an extremely powerful idea for legitimacy of Muslim rulers who are off, out there in what at the time were marginal areas. Um, now, so what happens in this period of, let's say, the 900s to the 1300s is the concept of caliphate becomes much less important. So you have this contestation over the, the title of caliph in the 900s and the 1000s. But by the late 1000s, early 1100s, the Fatimid dynasty is no longer a threat. The uh, Umayyad dynasty in Spain has been conquered. And what really, from, you could say, around maybe 1100 to going up into maybe even the late middle, early modern period, the 1600s, the concept of caliphate is not very important anymore. Because by this time, it's really the notion of sultanate that is important. And it's not an Islamic notion of sultanate. It's a continuation of the pre-Islamic Near Eastern tradition of the Roman emperor, and the Persian emperor, which is that the ruler is God's shadow on earth. The ruler is God's shadow on earth. The ruler is, but it deserves total obedience because it's also the ruler's duty to provide total justice. And this really becomes the, mod, the, 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 the mode of conceptualizing rule. And there's other streams that feed into this. So in the mid 1200s, when the Mongols invade the Middle East in 1250, and then you have a dynasty ruling most of Iraq and Iran until the early 1300s as a Mongol dynasty. And then the dynasty of Tamerlane from the late 1300s through the uh, early 1500s, mid 1500s in the Middle East, and through the 1700s in South Asia. The dynasty of Tamerlane, there are Mongols. Tamerlane marries a descendant, a daughter, a granddaughter, or a great granddaughter of Genghis Khan, and he rules as his title is the son in law. Tamerlane Damad, Tamerlane the son-in-law, i.e. the son-in-law son of Genghis Khan. Because from the mid-1200s until almost up into the 1800s, it is descent from the golden family of Genghis Khan, that gives you the right to rule. This is a totally, to, a notion that's totally un-Islamic, right? This is from outside the Islamic tradition. Marshall Hodgson calls this the age of Mongol prestige. It is descent from Mongol uh, heritage, especially the golden family of Genghis Khan, that gives you the right not only to rule Muslims, but the right to universal empire. And it's not the only notion of universal empire that, that feeds into notions of legitimate rule in the Islamic tradition in this time, because in 1453, when the Ottomans conquer Istanbul, what do they start calling themselves? Istanbul, or Constantinople is the capital of the Roman Empire. So who's the, ro the rule of the Roman Empire? Is Caesar. They call themselves Caesars. And they make the case to European monarchs that they have the right to universal empire because they are the inheritors of the Roman Empire. There's other ideas that uh, you, you'll see, the idea, the notion of being the next Alexander the Great. 
going back to the pre-Islamic Near Eastern tradition of Alexander the Great receiving advice from his teacher Aristotle on how to be a just ruler. So Alexander the Great becomes the epitome of just rule, and also the example of conquest and, and favor from God. The idea of the renewer, that's the word renewer, which you can probably barely read, uh, drawing on a hadith of the prophet in which he says that every hundred years God will send a renewer for his religion. Another, uh, here's the notion of descent from Genghis Khan, possessor of the fortunate conjunction. Not the most charismatic term in English, but in Arabic or in Persian, sahib Quran, the one who owns or who comes at the time of a certain planetary conjunction here, this is going back to pre-Islamic Near Eastern traditions of astrology, that the heavens have some, will, will tell you when certain events are propitious. And so when, when Tamerlane conquers Damascus in the early 1400s, the famous Muslim historian and uh, scholar Ibn Khaldun actually meets with uh, Tamerlane. And Tamerlane asks him about, you know, what do you think about my claims to rule and things like that. He says, you're the possessor of the fortunate conjunction. This is the time when the, uh, the, the certain conjunction of planets is coming about and you have the right to divine to, to, to universal empire because of that. And one of the, so let's take the Ottoman uh, Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent who lives, rules from 1520 to 1566. You can see pictures of Suleiman the Magnificent, and over his head, or you know, there are paintings of him. It'll they'll be titled. It'll say, Padishah Islam, the Emperor of Islam, Sahib Quran, the Possessor of the Fortunate Conjunction, the Mahdi, the rightly guided person whose messianic figure is supposed to come at the end of time. 1591 was the year 1000 in Islamic on the Islamic calendar. So around that time, people were also thinking in terms of messianic, the end of the world. And then, somewhere on that list, you find Caliph. Whatever, Caliph is just one of the things that these people are at this point. And another thing that's very important, oh, oh I, I won't get into that, actually. Um, <laughs> well, uh, maybe in the question. So, so Caliph is, is, is really not an important title at this point. It's just one of the things you can be. I think psychologically for the Muslim world it was very important because when Mustafa Kemal abolished they well, they, we're, we're still in the 1500s <laughs> you're, you're way ahead of us well, okay. okay so some uh, what are what are some other things that are you 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 people are looking very antsy you've been listening for things for too long yeah. If this were a class, I would give you a break. Bring, bring this up to the modern world. Okay. Why? Uh, you only want the modern world? No, no. Bring this that way. This Harris, is, Harris 15, this is 1574. Great. This is great. 1574. Sorry, 1774. Interesting event happened. The Ottoman Empire loses its first chunk of territory that's actually majority inhabited by Muslims to the Russians. It loses the north shore of the Black Sea. And there's an agreement that the Ottomans come up with in the Treaty of Kuchuk Kanarja in 1774 with Catherine the Great, where she acknowledges the Ottoman Sultan as the Caliph of the Muslims, even in Russian territory. Why is this important? Because what this means is now there's this idea that the, the, there's a Muslim ruler who's the Caliph. In this case, it happens to be the Ottomans. Because they're just one of the people who are calling themselves Caliph in the, in the, in the 1700s. He is recognized by the Russians as the protector, or at least the sort of religious leader of the Muslims who live under Russian rule. By the mid-1800s, at that point, it's become very obvious to the Ottoman Empire, which at this point becoming increasingly weak, that various European countries, Great Britain, France, Italy, uh, Russia, have uh, designs on encroaching on Ottoman sovereignty. But nobody wants to actually destroy the empire because that means someone else might take content of all and it's not the British or the Russians. So they don't they want to basically keep the empire propped up but while increasing their own each country's own influence on the the, the area of the Ottoman Empire. 
So what the Ottomans start doing in the mid-1800s is they realize that this notion of caliphate can actually be a very useful tool in foreign policy. By the way, later, in, in 1517, when the Ottomans conquer Cairo, they actually, the, the last Abbasid caliph, Mutawakkil II, actually goes and surrenders to the Ottoman Sultan Selim, the Grim. And Selim says, no, nice to meet you. Sends him back to Istanbul for a couple of years where he lives as a guest, and then he goes right to Cairo and dies there. Later on, in the 1700s and 1800s, you have this idea that Selim, the last Abbasid caliph, transferred the caliphate to Selim. This, there's no evidence this actually happened. Selim didn't write home. He wrote a letter home to his son saying, I just conquered the entire Middle East. And he didn't say, by the way, I own Malta the caliph now, in case you know, that will impress you. There's no mention of this. It's not important. It's only later on in the, in the late 1700s, the 1800s, that the Ottomans start bringing out this idea that they are the caliph as something special. And not just list item number seven on the list of why they have the right to universal empire. So, for example, during the uh, first war of independence slash the Indian Mutiny in 1857, the British asked the Ottoman Sultan to issue a ruling as the ruler of theory of Muslims around the world, the Ottoman Caliph, to say to the, the, the Muslim rebels, of course, there was rebellion both by Hindus and Muslim soldiers, that you should not rebel against the British. That didn't work. But the point is, uh, that's, you can start seeing how the Ottomans realize they have this tool they can use. And in the, the last time this is used is in ni November, 19, November 1914, when the Ottomans officially joined with the Germans in, on the, in World War I, they issue a declaration of jihad to all the Muslims in the world, especially the ones living under British rule in India and North Africa, and France, right? And North Africa, French colonies in North Africa, saying, fight with the caliph against your, the enemies of the caliph. Right. So this becomes, it's, that also doesn't really work. But the, you can see how this is becoming an important tool. Now, in, in, finally, we're now at the end, so you can all relax. 1924, the uh, Turkish parliament, or the parliament of the new Republic of Turkey, abolishes the caliphate. Uh, and now, in the, in the, from the end of the World, World War I until 1924, and in fact beyond that, there's a movement that rises especially in South Asia, a British India called the Khilafat Movement, which is really Muslims outside the Ottoman Empire, especially South Asia, em emphasizing the importance of the caliphate and urging the Turkish Republic not to, the, the authorities that take over after the fall of the Ottoman dynasty, not to abolish the caliphate because of this, its important role as a symbolic leader in the Muslim world. And when it gets abolished in 1924, then you have real, uh, it's not so much a crisis, but uh, m Muslims in especially the Middle East had looked to the Ottoman Empire as a potential political point of political rallying. And Muslims outside of the Middle East, in South Asia and Southeast Asia, had looked to the Ottoman Empire as a model for an alternative notion of modernity, a non-Western alternative <coughs> modernity. People don't remember this, but the Ottoman Empire had totally reformed its legal system, totally reformed its educational system, totally reformed its infrastructure, had railroads, had everything, had telegraphs, in fact, they, they fought really well in World War I. A third of the, all the British troops were stationed in, in the Middle East on Ottoman borders. Uh, if the Germans had happened and the Ottomans had won World War I, people would look to the Ottoman Empire as this victorious. It was victorious because they had reformed, because they had modernized. So people looked at the Ottoman Empire with a sense of hope as a model for mod an Islamic modernity. After they fall, that model yeah, is no, gone, and you have people to look for other alternative yeah, models. European uh, generals running. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's kind of the history of uh, all concessions. the caliphate. What is? How does this relate to ISIS? I would say it relates in this way. <coughs> there is really no agreed upon list of what you have to do to be the caliph, or what you have to be to be the caliph. 
Muslims, some Muslim scholars said you have to be descendant of the Quraysh. The Ottomans weren't descendants of the Quraysh, and they didn't care. Because other major Muslim scholars, for example, Abu Imam al Haramain al Juvaini in the 10 hundreds, he says Quraysh descent is not a requirement for the caliphate. So the Ottomans said, we're the caliphs, but we're not Quraysh from the Quraysh tribe, because the Quraysh tribe is, that is not a requirement to be the caliph. Only some Muslim scholars require the, uh, the caliph to be, it's uh, probably the majority. But historically, the, most of the people who claimed the title of caliph from the 1500s onward were not Arabs. They're not only were they not descendants of Christ, they weren't even Arabs. And they still claim to be the caliphs. So why is it that the Ottoman claim to caliphate was believed, and a lot of the other dynasties that we didn't get into claim to be caliphs, why is it they were not, we're not talking about them when we talk about the caliphs? Because the Ottomans happened to realized in the late 1700s to mid 1800s that the idea of being caliph and appealing as a religious authority to Muslims outside your territory and in fact under European or under Christian rule that this was a certain uh, gave you a certain uh, leverage potential leverage in, in relation to non-Muslim countries and they used that and this was believed by especially the European powers and so that's what really gives us the idea that the Ottomans somehow are the, are the bearers of the caliphate and that in 1924, the end of the caliphate was is some major moment. Uh, in reality, you could have a Turkic warlord who happens to take over all the Middle East and then gets up and says, I'm the caliph, and he would have just as, pretty much just as much a right to do that as uh, anybody else. What makes somebody you know, followed as a caliph is their success as a, as a state or as a leader. If you take over and you call yourself the caliph and you have a lot of power and you can command territory and uh, defeat your enemies, you'll probably be considered a legitimate caliph. Okay, thanks very much. And uh, we can now have questions for both of us, I guess. We don't have to look at my horrible handwriting anymore. Yes. I know this in all the discussion, I never hear the word mullah or ayatollah. Is that strictly Persian? <coughs> Um, so Mullah, I think, originally comes from Maulana. I'm not sure about that. Maulana meaning our master. But Mullah becomes, it, it, I think it originates as a term in the Persianate world in the, the like 1300s and 1400s. But then, it, 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 because the Ottomans themselves are, I mean, the, main, the, the state language of the Ottoman Empire until the mid 1500s is Persian. They're a Persianate uh, dynasty. Persian culture. So you see that word used by uh, Ottoman scholars. Um, but it just means, Mullah means a, it's a scholar, basically, a religious scholar. Ayatollah is used in, uh, in I think, beginning in the mid 1800s in, in, amongst the 12 Shiites in southern Iraq and Iran. It means sign of God, and now it means someone who's qualified to perform independent religious interpretation. Uh, I think in the later part of the Ottoman Empire, as you said, in 1924, when Turkish Parliament abolished uh, the caliphate, in India there was a huge, huge reaction um, against the British and the Indian Muslims wanted to restore the caliphate. So it's a kind of contradiction because they were fighting for their own independence from the British, but there was a nationalism also in Arab countries. The Arabs, a lot of it revolt against the Ottoman is based on their own nationalism. They wanted to be independent, although they were all Muslims. Mm -hmm. But that was not strong enough to pull them under the Ottoman rule. So the Ottomans, uh, the Arab revolt um, was sort of in contradiction. So I think it's, in, you know, we don't, we shouldn't go back and read history in the light of later events or in the light of Lawrence of Arabia, the movie. So <laughs> there, it wasn't like there was some awakening amongst all the population of the Arab-speaking world that somehow they were Arabs and they should unite and have their own state that was uh, going to rebel against the Turks. So the, 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 the leader who rebels leads the rebellion against the Ottomans, the king of uh, Del, uh, Sheriff uh, Sharif Hussein of Mecca and his two sons, right? He actually, if you look, he's, play, he's pledging his loyalty both to the Ottomans and to the British. And in the end, the British offer him a huge amount of money. He goes with the British. 
But it's really just his, he gets his followers and there's a certain number of Bedouin tribes to follow him. And that's that, the army. Um, and it then, of course, has support from the British and then uh, works alongside the actual British campaign in Mesopotamia and Palestine. So uh, we shouldn't look at the Arab revolts as some, you know, the entire world rose up, Arab world rose up against the Turks. Uh, if you look at the, the lists of people who belong to Arab nationalist organizations, that list is very small until 1918, at which point it balloons, because those people have previously been loyal Ottoman elite members, and now there's no longer any Ottoman Empire, so now they become uh, Arab nationalists. So, uh, you know, Arab nationalism, I think, really developed strongly after World War One, not uh, and really only strongly after World War Two. It's not something I think that is an important force. Before. Well, I think it was incipient, but it would have grew given the time, uh, because that's the history of the world is. I don't think. Do you think that Arabs would have consented to live under the Ottoman Empire for uh, much longer? I think that all the. I think the Ottoman Empire. It, it's provinces were all falling off into various national causes. I'm not sure if that national cause would have been one of Arab nationalism as opposed to Egyptian nationalism or uh, southern Iraqi nationalism or certainly there wouldn't have been Jordanian nationalism because there wasn't any. May I ask a question? Uh, yeah, I mean, what, I'm answering the question. Yes, why don't what you about, ask? What about uh, the 1700s? Yeah. Uh, Dahra Marzidani, uh, Southern Palestine, Akka Blood Safad, and uh, and Southern Lebanon. Uh, he he governed for seventy five years. Dahra Omar Zidani. The center might know something about him because yeah. uh, Brahim Sabah was his minister. So, and so the, the, he the, the he was it was a secular, wasn't it, uh, movement? So all the Ottoman Empire, like I said before with all these pre-modern states, you have very limited central control. And the Ottoman Empire, it, it's an interesting empire, right? From the basically 1299, which is the usual date of the beginning of the empire, until its fall in 1920, 1922, 1924, uh, there's not even another dynasty that, that is a serious competitor with them. And this is a very long period of time to go without even a comp com com competing dynastic claim within the state. And that's because the Ottomans were very effective at uh, convincing local populations that it was in their best interest to be part of this overarching system because they actually could have a lot of local autonomy. So people in what later on became the Mutasadrafa of Lebanon, and later became states of Syria and Jordan and Iraq and things like that, these people often did live under uh, the rule of local uh, nobles, under various, uh, various titles, many of them Christian, many of them uh, Muslim. And so, I mean, this is one example of that. Yes. So, uh, this is uh, what I, I, I realized based on both of your lectures. And that is, so it seems like the idea of the caliphate isn't, the caliph isn't this powerful, all-powerful person. That's the first thing, not like the sultan. The second thing is that it, but it did offer some sort of religious unity or legitimacy throughout its history. So, could you then conceive that, you know, even if the Arabs, you said, maybe want to have the same or the Egyptians or the Indians or whatever, you could still have that framework within the concept of some maybe elected or appointed leader who is the representative of the Muslim world, which you would call the caliph. So the, the role of the caliph as a, let's say, conveyor of some kind of legitimacy or religious leadership is also contested. So scholars like Al Ghazali died 1111. He, there's certain scholars like him who believe that if there's no caliph, not no not nothing in Islamic law is valid. Your marriages aren't valid. Nothing is valid. You need the caliph to exist because the caliph, even if he has no power, the caliph is the the pin, the source from which the entire system of the Sharia and Muslim religious life flows. Uh, Al Hazali's teacher, Al Juvaini, says that's nonsense. The person who is whoever is in charge and has power and can establish justice, that's the caliph. Um, and so he's much more functional by Al Ghazali has this notion that you have to have this formal office of the caliphate, or else nothing Muslims do is really valid. And Muslims 
since then, I think you, they kind of fall between these poles. Uh, the majority of them would, because they lived under some Muslim rule or another, they didn't doubt the Islamic legitimacy of their lives or the state they lived in. Uh, this only becomes a problem when Muslims are living under states that are obviously not Muslim. So when the British, when the, the Muslims of, in, in South Asia or in India are living under British rule, non-Muslim rule, they're, uh, especially after the, um, the 1770s when the British East India Company actually starts administrating areas and has Sharia courts that are run by British judges and things like that. Uh, there's a lot of debate amongst Muslim scholars in India. Are we still under? Are we still living in the abode of Islam? Are we still living in Muslim rule? Uh, Could you have that exist, for example? Like, yes, there's maybe Muslims who live in the United States or Crimea or whatever, but that country, uh, its political rule is that the Muslims can accept that, but it's up to the caliph to basically represent their interests as well. So, so I think that I, that idea really only there was a there was the question of what to. How do you talk about non-Muslim minorities living in Muslim-majority states? That's an issue that comes up uh, throughout Islamic history, especially after the Christian kingdoms in what becomes Spain expand. Uh, after uh, 1085, they conquer Toledo, 1236, they conquer Cordoba, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the, ma the majority answer is that Muslims shouldn't live there. They should not live under non-Muslim rule. Another answer is that they can continue to live there as long as they're able to practice their religion freely. And if they're able to practice their religion freely, there's not really a question of their interests being spoken up for because they're, the only interest that matters religious, for Muslim scholars is whether or not you can practice your religion. If, you know, otherwise, it's nothing, you know, no one cares you know, if you can't get a cheap house or something like that. That's not the most problem. So uh, this, I, what you're talking about really comes up after the late 1700s, when you have the idea that European sovereigns can be the official protectors of religious minorities in the Ottoman Empire, like the, the Tsars of Russia are the official protectors of the Orthodox Church there, uh, the French king is the, or the French government is the official protector of the Catholics, etc., etc. Then, and you also the idea of the Muslims then, the, the Ottoman Caliph being the official protector of uh, Muslim subjects. I think that that's not. I, I don't know of an example, and I'm not, I'm not sure if someone else does. I don't know any example where you could say that the Ottoman sultans after Kachuk Kanarja somehow actually really had some important influence where they were able to better the condition of Muslims living under Russian rule. I can't think of any example. Uh, European rulers were certainly able to promote the interests of, religion, of Christian minorities under Ottoman rule, but they could do that because they were powerful, and this was actually, for them, a way of exerting their authority. Whereas the Ottomans didn't have that power. But in the modern period, where you now have states that maybe are a little more powerful, or have, we have a, more international organizations that can communicate, work together to help you know, people in other countries, whether you're religious minorities or not, do you think that a model like that is more practical, where you maybe, maybe we have a bunch of different Muslim countries based on ethnicity, or whatever they want to be based on, mm -hmm. but they still have some sort of confederation based on this caliph, I mean, yeah, there's the, organization, there's the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, which I think was founded in 1957, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, you could have that if you, had, if you took the head of the OIC and you just said this person is now the caliph. Yeah. yeah, I think that would in effect be what it is. Right? There are a couple, couple of points that uh, you know, we can keep on looking at history and we can keep on looking at concepts and see uh, in today's world uh, what are the claims and where do we go? The first point that we, uh, you brought up, uh, that when in 1924, the Turkish parliament abolished Khilafa, that there was a, a huge outcry in, in India. In fact, that is not true. There was a Khilafat movement, yes. but the Khilafat movement essentially consisted of two brothers, Muhammad Ali and Shaukat Ali. Uh, there was some stuff going on in the northwest, in the Bukhul area, uh, but they were more focused on the Hedra movement, uh, which said if we want to defeat the British, we have to immigrate to Afghanistan, get ready, and then come back and attack. Uh, and the reason I know about that is because my grandfather was assigned that role. It was a, it was a big failure, it was a huge failure. Uh, 
the, the uh, Muhammad Ali and Shaukat Ali went around looking for someone who would accept the title of Khalifa, just the title, and no one would agree. They even went to, to see uh, Abdul Aziz, who had just started conquering uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the east and the, the Najat area. Mm -hmm. So it really is it's, it's a good it's a good story for the Indians to tell, but in fact there was no huge Khilafat movement, uh, and the the people of the Middle East, especially in Lebanon and so on, uh, they didn't like the Turks to begin with, mainly because they had become more oppressive, uh, particularly in tax collection and so on. Mm, sure. uh, so the uh, uh, I mean the. That you agree with what I was, I was saying. The, the religious fact that the, the Ottomans have a common religion with Arabs or Muslims, South Asians, is not even that time sufficient no. to hold them together as an empire no. or as a no. caliphate. No, no, no. In fact, the differences among Muslims, as I started to say from the beginning, the differences within the different groups have always been dominant. Uh, rather than the religious uh, unity. What about the Ummah? For all Muslims? Well, no, actually the word Ummah for Muslims, uh, the Quran uses the word Ummah for uh, the people of all prophets. Um, all, all prophets. That, that's called Ummah. And there are many, many Ummahs. Uh, and and when, when the word, this is Ummatun Wahida, to the prophet, it comes after a series of statements about other people. Uh -huh. So you cannot even say it's talking about the Prophet. In the Hadi Ummah to come Ummah and Wahida, it's probably all of those other Ummahs and that you are a part of this Ummah. But I mean, certainly, you know, the idea that Muslims worldwide belong to one Ummah is extremely. But he said that. The origin of the Ummah. Yeah, the origin of it is multiple. Yeah, well, I mean, it could be. But, but I mean, remember the, the Prophet was talking to Muslims Christians and Jews and pagan Arabs and saying you all should become followers of Islam. That's right. Uh, so he was kind of making a call, uh, but the idea that the, the Quran also says, you know, you are the best ummah brought out for the for the people, uh, and Muslims understood that to be talking about Muslims. Um, so after the the death of the Prophet, Muslims understand these references of, of ummah to mean. The followers of the Prophet. Muhammad. But you don't need a khalif, a khalifa to have an ummah. That's the point. Uh, no, you don't need a khalifa to have, to have an ummah. Yes. Um, thank you both for your presentations, um, Dr. Jaffe. I actually have a question about. So maybe I misheard you, but after you finished your presentation, you said that you don't think that it's possible to have an Islamic state because of a, there's not unity. Um, you were talking about how no universal a universal single state. A universal single. A confederation state. is possible, mm -hmm. okay, but even that is problematic. And the reason is that the Muslims, uh, you see, as soon as it went beyond Medina. It got to other cities, it became a problem immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Dr. Brown talked about, uh, you know, later people claiming to be uh, sultans and so on, which is a little later. Mm -hmm. uh, but in fact, Abdullah ibn uh, Zubair, uh, you know, did not accept Yazid and declared himself Khalifa. He was a Khalifa for uh, 12 years. Yeah. yeah. You know, so as soon as you went from Medina to other cities, then there were more leaders. Okay? And therefore, you had to now rule by consensus. Mm -hmm. okay? And then the nature of the, of the rulers is they don't like consensus. Uh, and I think another point that we, we need to remember, the Umayyads are the people who took that leadership and made it to a kingship. Mm -hmm. They did not understand the Prophet. They were the latest Muslims. Mm -hmm. That's right. So they were not among his companions. They did not know what he, his thought was and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, they, went, they went to the Roman Empire. Right? They go to Damascus, okay? which is an entirely different culture. Uh, and they took all of the institutions from the thing. In fact, they didn't even uh, make their own coins for decades. Mm -hmm. okay? 
And when they did, they took a Roman uh, a coin and just changed something on it. Mm -hmm. okay. So I think that the, the, the thing that is important is when we look at history in retrospect, we can make it look smooth. Okay? Uh, this is like, you know, when you teach science, everything looks great. But it doesn't when it is happening. It's always messy. Uh, so the question is, what is it that was common? And the answer is not much. Okay? Uh, but I think Dr. Brown made a good point. When you are expanding, it's easy to do things. <laughs> but as soon as you stop expanding, then people, you know, uh, start asking questions. The Bu'is, uh, the Bu'is were actually running the government. Mm -hmm. And in fact, our, our uh, you know, even our Shia uh, institutions, uh, the the Ghadir issue and the Muharram and so on, they were all established by the Bu'is. Okay? So even the whole concept of the Shia Imamate is developed during the Bu'is time, 8th and 10th century. 975 or something. Okay. So the, the thing is, you, you cannot look at history in retrospect and make it look pretty. Okay. But the thing is, the concepts are there. The question is, how universal were they? The answer is, they were never really universal. And people disagreed as soon as more centers of power became available. Okay. So my question is then that. Doesn't that, so I'm really sort of a stickler on words, right? So I think that Good. when yeah, I think that, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so like the Islamic state, sort of what Dr. Brown was talking about, like using Islamic hate versus, you know, using Islamic state. If you say the word Islamic, and maybe I'm being too simplistic, but I feel like who even posited in the first place that there could be a universal one? It doesn't Islam already provide as a theology room for pluralism in terms of thought of different leaders, this idea of consensus, this idea of representative government, this idea of religious freedom and minority rights. When you're talking about a state, we focused a lot on the concept of a ruler, of a power, but there's so much more that goes into a state than just a figurehead, which frankly, I would argue is not even necessarily Islamic in that sense sort of what you're arguing. Is that too simplistic well, to no, say? Not, well, not really, but the thing is that the word Islamic itself is problematic. Mm -hmm. Because when you say Islamic, mm -hmm. in a legal sense, which is you're a lawyer, uh, there's not a single definition. Mm -hmm. Because we, we have, one of the things that I tell people, especially the academics, I said, you know, our traditional way was to say, we disagree, I think I'm right, I think you are wrong, but I accept the possibility that you could be right and I could be wrong. I mean, that was our tradition, okay? And we always ended our documents by saying, Wallahu alam. Whenever there's a disagreement, you know, well, God knows, here is my opinion. We have gone away from that, Wallahu alam, even in our scholarly discussions, and that's a problem. The second point that is important is we, we, we throw the word Islamic into everything now. Okay? We have Islamic centers and Islamic schools and blah. I mean, there's nothing Islamic about these schools. Okay? Or even these centers. Okay? They're just centers. Uh, so the word Islamic doesn't make anything Islamic. The question is what are the, what are the principles involved? What are the authorities? Where do these authorities come from? Is there a consensus? If there's no consensus, it cannot be universal. Okay? And there is very little consensus, in fact. I think the, the, the reason you don't see the term Islamic used to talk about states is because um, Muslims are always either, Muslims are always ruled by other Muslims. And there's basically, the only period that they're not is basically 1250 to around 1295 in parts of Iran and Iraq under the Ilkhanids, who then become Muslim. So. Uh, there's, it only becomes an issue, and, and as long as the ruler is Muslim, and the ruler says that the Sharia rules, and that just that can mean anything basically. Um, there's no that that state is considered legitimate by Muslim scholars. Uh, when does that when does it become a problem when you're clearly ruling people who are not Muslim and who have a totally different civilizational and religious vision than you? 
which happens basically under in the colonial period. Mm -hmm. And uh, in India, that happens in the late 1700s. Mm -hmm. And in the Ottoman world, that happens, Mediterranean world, that happens from the early 1800s on. Mm -hmm. And so that's when this becomes an issue. Mm -hmm. And that's when you start having uh, movements calling of various stripes and various sorts calling for some notion of Islamic rule. Mm -hmm. And when the Ottoman Empire collapses and you have the last kind of great Muslim state you know, goes out of existence, uh, then you, they, people start looking for local Islamic movements, local Islamic states uh, to provide legitimate rule. But look, even, even people like Mududi, who is the only one who's written stuff about this, mm -hmm. uh, Mududi never talks about a universal khilaf or universal state. He explicitly says, here is what we think should happen in Pakistan, and everybody else has to figure out their own way as to how to work. Yeah, there are, you know, specific issues. What kind of a judiciary should we have? Uh, uh, you know, how about uh, making sure that the laws that are made are not against Islam? Do you need two supreme courts? And he said no. Not just he said no, he had 17 scholars agree with him. You know, he's the only one who has had meetings where bring everybody in and bring the Sufis and say, okay, let us discuss what the principles are. Uh, and, and even the question of simple things, the head of the state should be a man, which he explicitly says in his books, right? But when in Pakistan in 1964, uh, 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 Fatima Jinnah mm -hmm. was running against Ayub Khan. He supported her, uh, and I went to his lecture. I was teaching in Karachi at that time, and and, and he says, "Well, there are other uh, requirements for being the head of a state, okay? and I don't remember all of them." But he said one of them is being a man, and then he 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 goes through each one of those. I couldn't hear everything. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, and he says at the end, he says, therefore, the only qualification Ayub Khan has is that he's a man, and the only disqualification Ms. Fatima Jinnah has is that she's a woman. I mean, he, you know, he backed down even on that one, because there are, there are other factors involved. What about the Muslim qualification, the head of the government? Huh? Head of the government being a Muslim. Yes, that one is. Uh, uh, that's there's a, there's part a green, there's part a green, of the constitution. There, there's a good agreement on that. But not a man. Yes. I think where this is going, on one of your first slides, Dr. Shafi, you talked about this calling for Islamic government as a response to corruption. So, bridging to what Dr. Brown just said before, the point at which in modern times, What's being called for is the substance, not as much as the form of Islamic rule. It may have the title, and that might have been arrived at through all this historical discussion as a sort of will to power kind of form, uh, or, or you know, establishing the substance uh, in one way or another. But what the substance is, is the criteria <coughs> under which one carries out rule Islamically. Well, I don't know that it's Islamic. But well, but according to the criteria of justice. So, I mean, I think a good, a good example of what you're saying is that, you know, in, since 1999, all the northern states of Nigeria, the like Federation of Nigeria, declared Sharia law, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and people, Boko Haram's argument for why, they said, no, this is just political Sharia. <laughs> this is state. Basically, you guys are. You guys arrest little thieves and deal with them according to Sharia law, and the, you have this huge corruption at the top levels, and no one gets punished. So, but you're precisely right. I mean, I'm not advocating for Boko Haram or anything, but I mean, my point is, within one of their arguments is actually this isn't Sharia because the big thieves, the big, the, the great examples of corruption, are being totally unaddressed. Yeah, but the thing is, as far as the masses are concerned. They don't really care about the big issues. They know that the, the legal systems don't work in these countries. Okay. They know that the, the system up and down is corrupt. They know that the old systems, the tribal systems, really, because you know one of the things we forget is that 
most of these people, if you, if you go to the tribal areas in Pakistan and Afghanistan and so on, they consider everything they do is Islamic. Okay. Uh, so, because they think their tradition is Islamic. Uh, but the fact is, the system worked. If there was a crime, they took care of it. Okay. If there was a case, the case that went to the court, it was decided. It didn't stay there forever. Uh, you don't have, in Egypt or uh, Turkey now is improving, you know, where the entire system is corrupt. You know, every single tier of the, of the court system is corrupt. So what people are looking for is, we have these problems, and we cannot go anyone to come up with a solution. And maybe, you know, they, they, they want to use the word uh, Sharia, but in fact what they say is, let our local leaders decide. Really. In Afghanistan, even though we've been forcing the, the, the modern system on them, most of the decisions are still made by the tribal councils. Uh, and, and one American uh, reporter uh, uh, complained that there was one case that went to the thing and the guy who was in charge, he consulted 17 people. He said he was very upset with the fact that he consulted 17 people before he decided. Well, that's the way the tribal systems work and that's the way the, the old Sharia systems work. You, know, you did not apply the law you did justice, which was not always applying the law. And I think people are looking for solutions, is really but what are it is. these societies destined to live? Wait, hang on, hang on, hang on. Uh, there might be other questions before we have to leave. I want to make sure everybody who has questions gets a chance to ask questions. Hamid, do you have a question? <laughs> you're, got, you're referencing something there. I've got a jumbled collection of things, but I'm going to try and limit myself because I um, okay, so I think one point that I wanted to kind of bring up uh, in Dr. Shafi's presentation, I think there was much playing up of this kind of question of difference, which I don't think anybody would deny. But I think, um, you know, on a few different uh, points, uh, for example, one, like how do we even use the term Islamic? You know, uh, what does that mean? There's only differences. That's one thing. Well, then, on the other hand, this question of, for example, uh, you know, there was never really any significance to the Khilafah because there was never one central thing. I, again, I find it a little bit difficult to kind of contend with these kinds of um, presentations of the issues because, the same way there are differences within liberalism or differences within communism, we still don't know what liberalism or communism or democracy is. Same goes for Islam. Again, like it's a reference point to which. People are making a claim when they are trying to uh, say, you know, I am operating within an Islamic framework. It can be broadly considered, it can be narrowly considered, and there's going to be differences of opinion over what that is, but I think that the use of the term in itself cannot be uh, deemed illegitimate or out of balance. People will make these claims. Same goes for, again, this question of uh, the caliphate or the Hilafa. Um, again, I think we'll, we'll probably, uh, somebody have kind of highlighted this point that even within the differences uh, of authority within Medina, it didn't mean that there isn't, you know, more multiple governors or rulers within Medina. There was one system, and this is kind of is a good segue, I think, to my second point, which is again, I think the topic, as it was kind of presented uh, for this whole discussion, with this question of the possibility, like, of the universal. Uh, some state, and obviously the presenters were kind of working uh, against this. And, and I agree, I think if we're going to be talking about a conception of a universal Islamic state as in a very centralized thing where essentially you have one dictator at the top kind of doing, uh, you know, whatever he wants essentially. Um, and I think, again, we, even if you come to the modern period, you'll find very few groups that really pushing for this, maybe a group like ISIS might put this up in forward, and that's their conception of what it should look like, including all Muslim things well, wherever, and you just have this at the bottom of the top. But most uh, Islamist groups even that advocate for this kind of thing, but they look at the uh, career, you have many other groups now, you have uh, Israel Umar, so in the Middle East, you have Israel Tajdi, you have and many of these uh, groups, when they conceive of 
both, I think, the, the, the conception of the caliphate today, as they would kind of like to see it come to be, or for that matter, the way many of them theorize it historically as a sort of existence, they don't conceive of it in that way as a kind of universal, centralized thing. They, they do have much more nuance in their kind of conception of the... You mean they think of it as local, or they think of it as they think universal, of it as but highly like decentralized, they, some kind of confederation? Yeah, they, they think of it as something more like a confederation or a commonwealth or something else, even you know, in the original the history of it. And again, I think another interesting point, like this question, this tension between kind of uh, diversity and, uh, and unity. Uh, again, uh, again, when you look at the layout of this presentation, there was this kind of, I think, uh, attempt to kind of maybe play up this uh, multiplicity and diversity within the history. But then when we actually had this kind of rundown to by Professor Brown, despite the fact that, yes, there are obviously periods where that is more salient than others, for a significant uh, period throughout the history, and obviously, again, with different kind of salience, this idea of a central Catholic, which everybody refers to, even if they're not really governed by it, was a very salient point. And it might have disappeared uh, in this interim period, but then kind of came back towards the end of the Ottoman period. But I think that that in itself is something very significant, and it is why uh, throughout the 20th century and beyond, this concept of the caliphate remains so uh, salient in, again, the demand of whether it's Islamist groups or otherwise. So again, I'm, I'm I mean, I think your, your points are very good. And I mean, I, I have to say, so, you know, I was brought in this presentation, I'm a pinch hitter or whatever. Uh, but I mean, from my own perspective, I, I don't, I'm not in the business of saying people should or should not make claims of universal states. I mean, that's, first of all, uh, I mean, because I think people shouldn't be limited in their rights to political ideology. But I, I think also that really plays into precisely the hand of groups like ISIS, uh, which is that they their main the main thing that leads people to support groups like that is because those groups call out hypocrisy of global systems or of Western dominated systems. So there's the European countries can get together and say we want the European Union. Uh, you can have NAFTA. You can have Irish Americans who identify as Irish and some money to support Irish causes and Jewish Americans and some money to support Israel, right? So everybody has acknowledged right to some kind of the notion of contrariety with others with whom they identify across nation, the borders of nation states. And even you have the right to super, notions of supranational unions or of various sorts. And in fact, there's already organizational Islamic cooperation. Why is it that in Great Britain, in the UK, believing in a caliphate yeah. is something that will get you put on a list as an Islamic extremist? Yeah. Right? Where it technically, from the majority of Muslim scholars throughout history, they will tell you that Muslims are required to believe in the caliphate. As we just discussed, that can mean a lot of things. It can mean that somewhere way off, there's some guy who happens to be called the caliph who has no role in my life but he exists and that legitimizes my, my religious contracts. That's very different from saying, I'm gonna to respond to Abu Bakr Baghdadi's call and I'm gonna go and kill someone in the street. These are totally, two totally different uh, uh, phenomena, right? But I think, I actually think it's important if you believe in freedom of expression and in freedom of, of, of belief uh, and freedom of religious ideology that people be allowed to identify with supranational uh, organizations. Because otherwise you're basically saying Muslims don't have that right, but everyone else does.